Hey, um, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on the portfolio of technical knowledge. I am Kat Gumal and I'm the Head of Education and Professional Development at COIHT and I'll be chairing this webinar today. Um, I'm also joined by my colleague Greg Saunders who will be helping me with your questions. So if you have got any questions, please use the Q&A function which you should see at the top of your screen. Um, if you click on that, you can put questions in there. And if it's um, things we can respond to quickly, we'll respond to you directly. But we'd also like you to use that for putting your questions to the panel as well. So we've got uh, three fantastic speakers for you today. Firstly, we've got Lucy King, who's a principal transport planner at PJA, and Emma Case, who is senior transport planner at Mont McDonald. Both Lucy and Emma have successfully completed their PTK recently. Um, so they'll be giving you the, the candidate's perspective on, on the PTK and their advice on how to be successful. And we are also joined by Roger Bird, who's a senior lecturer at the University of Newcastle. And Roger is an experienced PTK assessor and he'll be covering sort of what an assessor is looking for in your PTK. And so we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end of the session. So do please post any questions that you've got for the panel in the Q&A box. People still coming in. Um, so I'll just start off with a bit of a background to the Transport Planning Professional Qualification. It was launched in 2008 to provide the professional recognition of the skills, knowledge and competence of transport planners in the same way that Chartered Engineer recognises the competence of engineers in the sector. It was developed jointly by the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation and the TPS, the Transport Planning Society, and it's still run jointly by those two organisations. But we at CIHT do the administration, so as you come to submit your, your PTK and eventually your portfolio of evidence, it will be me and Greg that you're in contact with about your application. Um, as well as CIHT and TPS members, it's also open to CILT members. Um, and as you might have noticed, sometimes we refer to it as transport planning professional and sometimes as chartered transport planning professional. And that's because when you successfully complete your professional review and you're rewarded transport planning professional, uh, you, sorry, you are rewarded transport planning professional, but because CIHT has a royal charter, once you've successfully got TPP, you're eligible to be registered as a chartered transport planning professional to get that top level of recognition as a transport planner. Uh, to gain TPP, you'll need to demonstrate your level of competence in a number of different units, covering the breadth of knowledge and experience expected of a transport planner. Um, and the units have been written to enable you to demonstrate your knowledge and competence no matter where in the world you've gained your experience. Um, the first stage of gaining Chartered Transport Planning Professional is demonstrating that you've got the underpinning knowledge to be a competent transport planner. And there are several ways of doing this. So you might get an approved MSc, you can complete the Transport Planning Society's Professional Development Scheme, um, complete a portfolio of technical knowledge, or you can do a technical report. The most common that we see people coming through on are either having completed an approved MSc or doing a portfolio of technical knowledge. And of course, that's that's what we're focusing on today. So what is a PTK? Um, it's a written report, so you won't have an interview at this stage of the process. You just need to put together a submission document, which, which includes a CV, eight evidence forms, one for each of the units that you're demonstrating knowledge for, some appendices if, if you want to, to provide supporting evidence and a CPD record. And unlike professional review, PTK can be submitted at any time. So as soon as you're ready, you can submit it. And in terms of what you need to cover, details of exactly what you need to cover are in the guidance downloadable from our website, and you'll need to take time to, to look at those. And I think some of our speakers will touch on that a little bit. Um, but as an overview, you can see the unit titles here. So you need to demonstrate knowledge for the six core technical units. So those are the ones on the left hand side um, and two of the four additional technical units. 
which you can choose depending on your own individual strengths. And all I'd say before I finish is it's not about listing your knowledge, it's about explaining how you obtained that knowledge. But I think our speakers today will go into a bit more detail about that. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Lucy. Great, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, I just want to say welcome everybody as well. And yeah, thank you very much for giving up your lunchtime to join this webinar. Um, my name is Lucy King and I am a Principal Transport Planner at PJA, also known as Phil Jones Associates. So a little bit about me to start with. Um, I came into transport planning from a civil engineering background and I joined PJA on their graduate scheme just over seven years ago. At that time, PJA was a relatively small company um, and they were focused almost solely on transport planning, but it has since grown significantly and now covers transport planning, placemaking and engineering, which has given me a good breadth of experience across the sectors. My focus has primarily been on development planning projects, um, largely for private sector cli clients covering the southeast of England. Um, but I've also been involved in a number of public sector projects, as well as international work in Saudi Arabia and Australia. Um, I began my TPP journey in about 2018, 2019, which was when I first started researching what the qualification was and what I would need to do to achieve it. Then during COVID, I was able to spend lots of time thinking about my portfolio of technical knowledge and doing some CPD to fill any knowledge gaps. But it wasn't until I got put in contact with a mentor through the CIHT in 2021 that I really started progressing with it. Um, I then successfully submitted my portfolio of technical knowledge in mid 2022. So it took me about a year of focused effort to complete my PTK with some time before that to initially think about key gaps in my knowledge. If I was going to do it again, my number one recommendation would be to get a mentor as soon as possible. So if you haven't got one, try and find one, either someone within your company who has already achieved the TPP or as I did, I found an external person through the CIHT as there wasn't anyone suitable within my company. Um, this was the routine that I established to get my PTK done. So obviously everyone has different ways of working, commitments and schedules, but this worked for me. So I put a reminder in my phone every day and aim to do at least 15 minutes each time. Um, some days I managed a lot more, other days I didn't have 15 minutes to spare, but whenever I did, I tried to keep to it. Um, I set myself some interim targets to complete each of the units, which I agreed with my mentor. And I also had regular catch up meetings with my manager and my mentor to discuss progress and any issues that I was having. And then finally, I would just recommend leaving plenty of time to do the other sections of your report. So that's your CV and your CPD, your continued professional development, as they took me a lot longer than I was expecting. Um, I thought it would be useful to run through each of the PTK elements and how I personally address them. So starting with the part one, which is the personal information, and it requires a completion of a portfolio of technical knowledge application form and a CV. So in terms of the CV, it's got no word or page limit. So unlike other sections of your PTK, so for me, it was an opportunity to get in um, anything which I'd run out of space for elsewhere in my report. And mine ended up being about six pages in total, my CV. Um, I started with an overview of my education and my employment history and a summary of my experience before setting out my project specific experience. And it was this project experience section that allowed me to summarise my involvement in a range of projects across each of the um, knowledge requirements, providing details that I wouldn't have been able to include within the word limit. So on the right here is an example of one of my project summaries. Um, which was for Ship Lake Neighbourhood Plan on behalf of the Parish Council. So I started with a project introduction where I set out what my role was. So working as part of a team to review the potential public realm improvements at a junction in the village. And then in the example following this introduction, I then set out how my work fit into the neighbourhood plan, 
linking to the policy knowledge requirement and then also the data sources that are used. So then linking to the data knowledge requirement. So the second part of the PTK is the bulk of it, which is where you provide your evidence of knowledge covering the eight units that Kat mentioned earlier. These are my top tips for completing the evidence sections based on what I learned from doing it myself. Um, so before I started, I thought about which competency I was most confident in, and I began with this one. Um, so it was a good way to get a feel for the kind of content that I was required to include, um, the writing style and how short 500 words really is. I then mind mapped my initial thoughts for this first unit that I'd selected. Um, so this was the example of the kind of mind map that I prepared for the data knowledge requirement. Um, so for me, this was a quick way of getting down my initial ideas for each of the criteria. Um, so, for example, in the bottom right of this um, slide for the emerging technology section, I'd noted that I'd attended a CIHT webinar on this subject. Um, that I used TomTom data and the flow data within project work. And then by having these ideas, I could then expand on these key points within my formal written response. So it was then time for me to start thinking about putting my initial thoughts together into a coherent response. And within this, I focused on demonstrating knowledge rather than experience. So although you can include project examples, um, it's about focusing on the knowledge gained rather than the experience that that project gave you. So for me, this was a section from my data competency, um, and I've included this extract as I think it illustrates the focus being on knowledge and understanding rather than experience. So in the blue at the top here, you've got some um, examples of data sources. Um, so here I've listed TRIX, National Travel Survey and Census data. And then the paragraph sets out the potential issues um, which can be associated with these. So providing knowledge of uncertainty and bias in, and how this can be um, reduced through cross testing in tricks. Um, and then finally, in green at the bottom, it sets out the key strengths and weaknesses um, of these data sources. So primarily of the National Travel Survey and census data. So then this is the later section of the same um, response. So in this paragraph, I did reference a specific project. Um, so that was for a development in Sissinghurst, um, but I specifically considered the knowledge that I gained from that. So within the Sissinghurst project, I was required to commission and analyze surveys. So within the PTK, I referenced the knowledge that I needed to have to successfully commission the surveys, such as checking for roadworks and needing to undertake the surveys in neutral months. And I then briefly highlighted the strengths and weaknesses of the surveys um, in the green at the bottom. And one thing that I would note is that 500 words isn't enough to be really detailed. So for me, it was about highlighting the main points such as the main strengths and weaknesses rather than all the strengths and weaknesses of that survey type. Uh, once I'd done my first um, unit, I then went through each of the others to try and fill, identify any gaps in my knowledge. And I filled these by talking to colleagues, by doing CPD and by getting involved in relevant projects wherever that was possible. And then finally, my final tip would be once you've drafted your 500 words, you can then check that your evidence addresses each of the knowledge points. So I don't expect you to be able to read this slide, um, but this was my method of checking that I had appropriately covered everything. So although you don't need to cover every single point in detail, for me, I wanted to make sure that I'd at least touched on each of the bullet points within the um, knowledge requirements. Um, so I colour coded my evidence in the same way that I colour coded the bullet points and then I could check that there weren't any missing colours and that I hadn't overly um, addressed one point at the expense of another. So then the final section of your um, PTK is your CPD record, so your continued, continued professional development record. Um, and as for your CV, this doesn't have a word or page limit. So on this slide, I've set out how I would typically record my CPD using this webinar as an example. 
So there's not one right way, but this is how it works for me. So I would identify how that activity was, was um, decided upon. So here I've said I am interested in progressing with my portfolio of technical knowledge and watch this webinar to learn more about this first step towards achieving a TPP. And hopefully you can then set out what you got from it. So hopefully for this webinar, you'll be able to say something along the lines of the webinar providing me with a greater understanding of my next steps towards completing my portfolio of technical knowledge and I have subsequently progressed with this. And I've also covered how many hours it took when I did it and then cumulatively added up the hours for the year. So for every piece of CPD I would do, I could then add to this table. So thank you very much. Hopefully that was useful. Um, and I will pass on to Emma for her presentation. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Lucy. Just bear with me while I'm trying to share my presentation here. Great. OK, so I'm Emma Case. I uh, currently work for Mont McDonald and I have successfully gone through the process and am now a chartered transport planner. So I'll just give you a little bit of background about me. I've at the start of my career from when I graduated, graduated from my undergrad, I uh, mainly worked in local government, uh, but within kind of the planning and transport realm. Uh, I was working in 2017 for Cambridge County Council uh, and had a quite a large stakeholder engagement focus on tackling congestion within Cambridge. Um, I, alongside that, did my town planning masters at Anglia Ruskin. Uh, through these two, two different aspects, I kind of gained a, a great enthusiasm for transport planning and, and kind of the, the, the realms and the remit of, of transport planning uh, within my the city that I lived in within Cambridgeshire. Um, so as part of uh, my next step, I, I became a graduate transport planner at a, a small consultancy. And that's where I started learning about kind of the different chartership routes I could go for uh, and then found obviously the transport planning professional and identified the best uh, kind of way and progress to be chartered for myself as, as being the PTK. Um, so that that started in, in roughly about 2019 when I identified that route. Um, I then have, have kind of gone through and, and, and uh, submitted my uh, PTK in winter 2022. And then early this year uh, was had a successful outcome. I then went straight into to working on my portfolio of evidence at submission. And then in June this year was successfully became a chartered transport planner. So uh, throughout my presentation today, I'm just going to be going through my PTK experience, uh, focusing on, on the different aspects on the screen. And so first off, so why PTK? Well, for me, it was one of you know the most simplest route for 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 kind of attaining this chartership. Um, so when I when I first kind of looked into it, I went on to the CIHT website and downloaded all all of their material they had, and then thought you know how do I then implement that into to way I'm working? I was, I was very early on in my career as a graduate, um, and then obviously I had to understand how I was going to get knowledge of all of those different aspects. I think similar to Lucy, I, I didn't have a mentor at this time. Um, and for me, it meant that I had quite slow progress at the start of my T PTK um, kind of journey. Uh, and that was very much around kind of time management um, and a focus on my career progression. Uh, and also as a graduate, you're coming in, you don't have all of the knowledge of, of all the units at that point in time. Um, so I, I very much focus on consistently updating my CBD and my CV as I went along uh, to identify where I did then have knowledge and, uh, and experience um, and and uh, kind of manage my time in that way of, of kind of focusing on those aspects of the PTK uh, instead of getting involved in writing the actual units to, to begin with. Uh, I then kind of, as I was gained knowledge throughout my career, decided that I needed further support to be able to complete my, my PTK. And that's, uh, as Lucy kind of mentioned, uh, where a mentor came in and, and really helped me kind of focus uh, uh, and understand how uh, the PTK should be written and in, in the different styles that, 
that that's kind of been outlined to you today. Um, what other things that were really helpful to me is internal to Mont McDonald's that we we have kind of this peer cohort. So a number of people at the same time as me were trying to go and submit their PTK. There, there was other peers around me that had already submitted their PTK and been successful. Uh, and so not just alongside my mentor, I had, I had other people I could contact and say, well, how did you do this? How did you approach that? Um, this also kind of aligned to the company processes. So as I was saying earlier, I consistently updated my CBD and uh, my CV. Uh, I also aligned kind of where the units were with, with uh, things like uh, my conversations with my line managers uh, within the projects I worked on um, and and try to progress my knowledge in that way. Uh, also, the, the main point of, of kind of help and support is, is the CHT themselves. Uh, they very much, you know, will respond to any emails you have and, and provide you with templates and they're really helpful in that way. There's also a wealth of, of material online that I, you know, can only stress how helpful that is in terms of reading that through thoroughly. OK, so as I said, yeah, I, I updated my CBD and my CV regularly. Um, and, and as part of this, I was able to kind of produce a mapping exercise uh, where I kind of outlined the units and where the, not I was going to get that knowledge from within my CBD and, and CV. So I could evidence, let's say, for, for different units where I, I've, I've either gained that knowledge on, in my career, uh, in the different projects I've worked on, or through different webinars or seminars I've attended or, or different areas of, of training that, that I've been on. Um, so this also then aligned to my personal development plan and which is kind of an internal to, to Mont McDonald's where I work at the moment as well, where we're trying to kind of map my career progression and and uh, as a whole, it helped me kind of focus on on where I needed to to then pick up that knowledge and then identify future ways to be able to do that. Um, so then, then after that, I, I kind of spent um, a full year really pulling together the, the different evidence and knowledge needed to, to write each unit. Um, I think I was on probably on maternity leave, which is a bit of a niche. Um, I wouldn't overly recommend trying to put the two together, but it very, very helped very much helped me kind of keep in touch with the industry and the developments in the industry while, while not working directly in projects at that time. It gave me kind of motivation and, and uh, focus on being efficient with my time as my time was drawn elsewhere and also meant that I was, was very consistent in the timescales. I had to be organised of when I was going to work on my PTK uh, and I think that for me, that level of consistency, you know, week in, week out, setting aside one hour here, one hour there uh, on the same time every week just meant that I could systematically go through my units and make sure I ha had the knowledge and, and uh, keep in touch with my mentor at the same time to be able to review some of my, my work and help point out in, any areas that I may not have hit the, the information correctly. Uh, and, and as we've spoken about and, and kind of outlined at the start, it's very much I started doing my PTK or that focus quite further on in my career. I think for me, I, I definitely would have started the knowledge aspects if I had a second chance to go, go through it a lot earlier on, because you do gain that knowledge from all different aspects, including your studies or your, your degree and things like that. So um, I think I struggled to, to begin with about writing that in an experienced way and as soon as it clicked for me that this is very much a knowledge um, then over experience then it was a lot easier to write this PTK and 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 kind of getting the language right. Uh, I think one of the main things for me is a takeaway that it, it's 500 words a unit so in in kind of actually when you can write 500 words that's not that many words but for me the real struggle was I could write a thousand words I had a had a you know enough in my CV to be able to probably write more on these units but actually the the main skill and and and, and as being a transport planner is something really important to have anyway is to be able to write the, those uh, that evidence that knowledge quite succinctly in those in those 500 words um, I think I started in the units I had most confidence in um, and I bullet pointed similar to Lucy about how I was going to eat, meet each one of the, the elements within each unit and then as I touched on, I use this as a stepping stone um, 
to to then launch me into doing my portfolio of evidence straight after some successful submission of, of my PTK. And actually, I had um, quite a lot. The units are, are obviously the same as you're familiar with the units. Um, so I had quite a lot of similar kind of exercising with the mapping, but then using that for proficiency and experience instead of just knowledge. Uh, and that's obviously overlaps with things like the CBD record and the CV that you also have to submit alongside your portfolio of evidence. Um, and I think as part of that, I was in that doing that one hour a week to, to kind of get myself yeah, kind of in that in that consistency of of um, submitting a units week on week. Uh, and I think that helped me then just carry that on and not have a break in between um, to then go on to to successfully uh, become a chartered transport planner. Thank you very much. Right. I shall now pass over to Roger. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, congratulations to Lucy and Emma who have really done most of my job for me because they've done an absolute cracking job presenting that information um, uh, and it's very good to see it. Uh, what I'll give you is a few um, ideas from my perspective as a um, as somebody who's assessing uh, these. My background, just in case you want to know, is I'm a civil engineer with an undergraduate degree in civil engineering and six years experience in local government and then 17 years in consultancy before I became a lecturer and along the way picked up um, being a um, chartered engineer and uh, getting an MSc. So uh, I'll split my uh, presentation into four sections. First of all, looking at the process, then the content, how you demonstrate knowledge and something about presentation. But along the way, I think you'll find this picks up quite a number of the things you've heard already. First of all, just so you know what the process we go through is when we're assessing these, uh, you have two assessors. One of them's an academic, that's a usual uh, lecturer, and one of them's from industry. Um, they're independent, they generally aren't in the same place, um, and we meet online when we do these assessments. We are uh, allocated then um, by Greg and the team in uh, Britannia Walk at CNHT headquarters, and uh, uh, you don't select who your assessors are. The, uh, all your documents are sent to us independently and we read through them, review them and comment on them. So uh, always to find that fascinating stage, uh, meeting up with a new person, you feel like you're beginning to meet them and get to know them through this document. And I remember being told as a, a young person approaching my chartered um, professional status exam was uh, that you, you start on 51%. You're somewhere in the middle, but your assessors have actually got a bit of goodwill towards you and you've got to build on that and make sure that you um, you demonstrate that you really are worth moving up the scale and not down. So start with that. We read your comments individually. We look through them and we want to know who this um, bright person is who, who we're looking enthusiastically at, who, who wants to join this great profession that we're all part of. And then possibly for us, the most nerve wracking part is when we exchange our comments um, because you don't know what the other person has thought. We do this independently and you always think, will we agree? Have we actually come to the same conclusions? And it's very encouraging that most of the time these days uh, we do. There are differences and that's why we then meet to discuss, compare and agree whether or not this candidate meets the knowledge requirements. And between us, we will then draft some feedback and guidance and whatever it may be. So that's the process we go through. The content, well, you're probably familiar with it, so I'm not going to spend too long on it, except to pick out some key points, which have, uh, some of which may have been made, but we'll just come across them because this can be where you can concentrate the effort. As you're aware, there's six compulsory units and two optional ones that you choose from a choice of four. On the policy context, the key things look for who and why and how. These are the really important areas that you show and demonstrate that you've understood uh, why policies are made, who makes them, who is responsible for them, because that's sometimes a, a weak point in, in some of these. People say, I know there are policies, but we don't know who's drafted them and why they've been done. Look for the reasons, look for the different spatial scales look at the responsibilities and another key area, look how they may change with time. 
And uh, in the last bullet point on that one, there's mention of finance, often something that people overlook. Um, what financial implications do they have? Laws and regulations are absolutely vital, governs all of this. Um, but the specification for this and the bullet points that guide you are actually about the shortest. But don't let that deceive you. It's still um, good to, to make sure that you use those 500 words wisely and make sure that you've covered them all. Look for the major laws on transport planning. Do you know what they are? And secondly, look at the other laws which affect all of our professional working life. Obviously, the areas of health and safety, environmental impact, development planning, um, uh, EDI, and uh, how we deliver all of these um, transport policies. So laws and regulations, make sure it comes across clearly that you've got your head around these. You obviously won't unlikely to have been involved in drafting and making laws, but that's one definitely where you need to be able to demonstrate your knowledge. And I think it was either Lucy, or well, it's definitely Lucy or Emma, said it's uh, the knowledge that matters. Now, often at this stage in your career, you will have some experience. You will have had experience of some sort. Um, and experience is a great way of gaining knowledge. Uh, where you haven't got the experience in something, you do need to demonstrate that knowledge. The third unit on data. And here we've got some key words which often get missed. Looking through these bullet points, and I, again, I'm not going to put them up because it make this presentation very, very long. Um, but look for these words which include limitations, strengths and weaknesses. Notice how many times that appears. And what we're looking for is discriminating knowledge. Show that you understand that some data, you just can't believe it just because it's there. Have you looked at it and does it make sense? Endless examples we can probably all give of data that we've been given over the years, which just didn't make sense. And you look through, you look why, and maybe it was out of date, or it was um, surveyed for a different reason, or calculations have been done with an error. Uh, you've got to be able to pick that sort of thing out uh, to show that you know how to treat data and make sure you therefore analyse and get a, a sound result. So one of the key things a client will be looking for, uh, can I believe this work? So you need to show that you've got an appreciation of how data works and uh, what appropriate sources are, and there'll be better sources than others. And it's great to see in there, and I think we've already heard about some innovative data sources. These are becoming more and more widespread and they will change. There will be new ones coming along. We're obviously looking at um, data coming now from social media. Uh, we've had students who've analysed Twitter feeds or X as it is now uh, in order to get traffic data. We've uh, looked at um, TomTom data that's been mentioned already. So these sources of data are getting broader and broader, innovative and new ones. Do look out for those as the bullet point says, uh, look for emerging sources of data particularly result of new technology. Have you had some experience with them? If you haven't, show that you know about it. Um, and also, how do you fill in the gaps and how do you deal with bias? Uh, was the survey made for the right purpose? If it was questionnaire data, what were the questions that were actually asked? Who were the audience? Because uh, clearly uh, getting a truly neutral data source uh, for questionnaires can be quite tricky. Then moving on to transport models and forecasting. This one normally is done quite well by most candidates because they've been involved in some sort of modelling forecasting work at some point. And transport models are many and varied. So there's all sorts of different modelling processes we can go through. So often they're done very well, um, but you must uh, show that you have an understanding of what you've done. It's not just a question of saying, I've plugged these numbers into this computer programme and got these results. You need to show that you've understood what you've done and what the results mean. And a transport planner is, uh, at a department level is going to be somebody who really has good understanding, can guide and lead a project and make sure that uh, any clients that you're referring to uh, or people who receive these results can believe them and rely on them. So uh, moving on to appraisal and evaluation. Again, this is not one that most people You've usually had some experience in, and therefore it's quite well presented. A word of advice again in each of these bullet points, you will be asked to show the strengths and weaknesses. And certainly, that appears twice at least in the bullet points for this uh, module, this unit. The underlying, uh, underlying principles are there. Look for how 
these units and the, the, the bullet points that are mentioned in each unit are trying to get you to show a really deep level of understanding of what you're going on. And the evaluation, a very important part of the process, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Stakeholder engagement, on the other hand, is often one that few people have had a chance to have a go at because it quite often comes a little bit later in your career as you've got more experienced and whatever sort of work you've been going through. Some people get it early in their career and that's great if you've had it. Um, but key things there to make sure that you know the need, you know the key stages in doing uh, stakeholder engager, engagement um, and that need for empathy and recognition. Schemes and things that transport uh, planners get involved in often have very wide ranging effects on other people's lives. And as everybody's interested in transport, I'm sure you've all found already in your careers, everybody out there is an expert because everybody travels to some degree or other. If they don't travel, they wish they could. And what you've got to realise is the impact you're having on them. So everybody has an opinion. They'll all want to share it. How do we gather all of those opinions and make sure that we try to get some sort of consensus, middle ground or something that's acceptable to the largest number? Again, potential for bias. Uh, when it's appropriate, demonstrating empathy and recognition. These are all more than just turning the handle on the process. This is about really understanding the process and that there are real people involved. So crucial that we get that right. Um, but again, if you've had experience in doing it, then clearly you'll be able to build on that. Um, but make sure if you haven't had experience, you can um, uh, show that you know about the processes. Moving on to the chosen units, these are often building on those previous ones. So notice how these are applying them. And the reason they're chosen units is because these are often your chance to show what you've learned in other units and then applied them in one of these four areas, which may be uh, an area that you are working in. Obviously, this, uh, this, you've got to pick two of these. So it could be that you haven't had experience. But again, if you haven't had experience, demonstrate knowledge. So in applying uh, the first six units to uh, developing strategic and master plans, uh, how do we go about it? What are the principles? How do we determine priorities? And notice how this is, again, more than just I know about it. It's knowing how to set priorities. What are the um, adoption processes? And how do these plans get monitored? And how do they change with time? not just a case of tick box, I've done it, there you are, it's your policy, and um, things will change over time. Uh, unit eight is applying the principles of transport system design. Again, it's a process of getting through data to modeling to design. How have you gone about that? And again, all the modeling processes may have strengths and weaknesses. And notice how so many of these are also involving finance. How do we get the money to do these? Uh, if you've had problems along with the way in doing the design, what problems did you overcome? In 500 words, it's not easy to give a full commentary on something like that, but do what you can. And remember that we often learn more from our mistakes than we do from things that just go right all the time. So if you've had a quick um, summary of a problem and how you solved it, that looks really good. Changing travel behaviour. This really gets to the human end of doing things. So we're getting down to words which some people find difficult with. If you come from a highly numerical um, numerical background or engineering background, sometimes people struggle with this. How do we change behaviour? But it's a key part of it. We're dealing with people at the root of this. It's people and their desire for mobility that causes us um, to, to want to uh, get into transport planning in the first place. So we're looking at how the modelling has been done, how the data has led to plans and actions and what effect they have had on individuals. And don't forget that as we go through this process, often we put an intervention in place and that mere intervention has caused further changes in behaviour. So while we think we're solving a problem, you're actually setting another loop up as you go along. Have you covered that? What are the methods of evaluating? And again, in, in that unit, there's bullet points about finance and monitoring. Don't forget those. And finally, the commercial and operational management of transport systems. We find this is probably the one that's chosen least frequently by people, but if it suits you, absolutely go for this one. 
and look at all these different modes of transport that are involved. It could be any number. It's not just about planning bus systems or uh, freight distribution networks. We could be looking at this, as um, it mentions on the list here, cycle sharing, car sharing, mobility as a service. You may well find yourself getting involved in that sort of a transport system. So don't be narrow minded in how you interpret that. Again, multimodal, think about uh, how all of these uh, things operate. Notice the role of new and emerging technology in there. And of course, risk and finance comes into those as well. So I've alluded to a few weak points as we go along there. I've picked up a few more that I've thought about along the way. Many of these units suggest that you should uh, be able to mention the weak strengths and weaknesses of methods of data sources or anything like that. Again, this points to the fact that we sometimes make mistakes along the way and we learn more from our mistakes than we do from what goes right. So look out for that. Another thing to realize is that things will change with time. And even in the um, assuming many people here are early in their career, you may not have realized this, but in your time in the um, in your career, you will see many things change. Processes, documents, the way we handle things like environmental impact assessment. Uh, you look back at history, you will see how much that has changed over the last 30 or 40 years. So it might well do that during your career. So be ready for change. How will you handle it? Another thing that's sort of related to that is monitoring, monitoring of policy, monitoring how rules are changing, monitoring the process of your projects, monitoring the outputs from uh, stakeholder engagement, whatever it may be. Look out for that. That's a key thing and again, leading to change. Something else that people sometimes weak on is policy formation. They know the policy is there, but they're not totally sure or clear on how it comes about. Whose responsibilities and going back to the legal part, the laws and the frameworks for it. And I've mentioned stakeholder engagement is often one that people find weak, uh, but it's about the communication of your ideas. So be ready to, to look up and read up on that one if you haven't had ex um, experience in using it. And similarly with data, um, making sure that you're able to be critical, show that you understand the strengths and weaknesses. Data isn't right just because it's data and it's landed on your desk and somebody's given it to you. Look at it, always check, say, is this right? Does it make sense? Are there anomalies in here? Was it? 16 hour data when I wanted 12 hour data? Is it weekday flow and it, um, instead of including weekends? You know, there's a, no end of sources of ways in which um, that's just with traffic flow. You could be looking at um, questionnaire type data and saying, was this from a particular user group? Who were the users that we uh, interviewed to get these answers? Oh, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Maybe we need to get a wider set of data. So be prepared to be critical. Look for the strengths and weaknesses of your data. And just on the way people draft these um, portfolios of technical knowledge, make sure you try to put the relevant information in the right units. If you put it in the wrong unit, your assessors are stuck with a tangled web of uh, information and we're trying to uh, link everything up to make sure um, it, it will be appropriately handled. So moving on to how we assess the units. It's done on balance. You don't have to show you've nailed every single bullet point in there. But what you must do within each unit is show that you've seen the important themes and addressed them. And just look back at that little point, uh, series of weak points and try to make sure you've addressed those because these are key areas that we need to be sure that you do. You do have to pass every unit, but each unit you only have to pass on balance, but we would be looking for you to show a thorough knowledge in uh, that unit as a whole. Just a word then as um, moving on to uh, demonstrating knowledge. Remember what Kat said at the beginning, this is a chartered qualification. So chartered professionals must be able to think, they must be able to solve open-ended problems, we've got to be able to design, evaluate things, and we've got to be able to communicate those results. So what sort of level of knowledge is it that you're there trying to demonstrate? Worth bearing in mind that some people um, take 
have an exempting degree, as it's called. That means they don't have to submit a portfolio of technical knowledge. It is assumed that because they have that master's degree, then they will have the less necessary level of knowledge. So rest assured that Cat and her team do go around the universities and check that all our degrees do deliver those. So we're looking at those units in the same way that you are, and we're trying to make sure that our degrees cover these. But just have a look at the levels of education. These are defined by the Department for Education. You can look at them up on the government website there. I've given it there. Level one and two are GCSE at two different levels. Level three is A-level. Levels four, five and six are typically what's covered by an undergraduate degree, or you can get the individual um, qualifications at those levels. But notice that level seven is a master's degree. And that is where uh, we are pitching this knowledge. That's the level of knowledge you are expected to be showing. The sort of knowledge that gets delivered at a master's degree. Only a PhD is higher. Now, typically, a master's degree will be one year of full time study. Two thirds of it's taught material, so you'll have lectures and assessments in that, but one third of it is a research dissertation. And that's what students are doing an MSc programme at doing, is showing them capable of doing independent research uh, that will get written up in a typically 15 to 25,000 word research project. So it's about demonstrating that level of knowledge um, and only a PhD is at a higher level than masters. So how do you go about doing that? Well, to some extent, this is how we set our exam questions. And I often share this with students so they have some idea. And this might take you, if you've never heard of it, into something called Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning. I'll give you the reference or how to search for it at the end. But if you think about it, we start off by saying the basic stuff I know about. That's about knowledge and facts. It's quite simple questions. Can you remember something? What happened? How many? Who was it? You know, and you can apply this probably across history, geography and other subjects as well. But then the question is a little bit more deep when you say I learned the difference between I understood, I comprehended. Can you write something in your own words, which means you've understood what you were told? What was the main idea? And then can you apply that? So it's building on that understanding to saying, uh, could this have happened in another place? Um, what factors would change if? So you're able to apply the knowledge and the understanding from the first two stages. And then we get analysis. This actually is where we as transport planners and engineers often find that educational theorists underestimate us because sort of doing the analysis is bread and butter for us quite often. Um, and then even further, going up to design. This is what's called by the educationists synthesis. You're creating something new. You're building on all of that knowledge uh, and then the analysis in order to create something new. And then you often have to compare those solutions to say which is the best one. This is evaluation. Now, it's worth noting, um, by the way, if you do ever want to search that, look, it's Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning, and there are a number of variations on that theme. But at master's level, we will be looking for things in the top two levels there. These are the levels that we would be expecting from master's degree. And so don't be surprised that that's the sort of level that you will be demonstrating in your portfolio of technical knowledge. You're creating new things, you're building things, you are making a new design, okay? Or you're doing the evaluation, you're looking for the best solution. So when we set exam questions, we often deal with open-ended questions and we are expected to at master's level. I've often written in exam questions and when I do the model answer, I say, there's no right answer to this question. I just want to see whether the student can create an argument along the following lines. Factors in favour, factors against, and then their opinion of which one's the best answer. Because that sort of shows that they are thinking at that level. And that's a level that a chartered uh, qualification will be looking for. So how will you go about then presenting that knowledge? I'll show you two or three examples here. Uh, they're deliberately very small in text, so you can't read them because I don't want you to be able to go back and identify the individuals. But real examples that we've had. Uh, in this one, I think the colours were there. So somebody has in, um, put the bullet points from the uh, submission form 
in red text and they've written their um, response to those points in black in between. So it's the black word that add up to uh, the 500 words. I think we as successors were meant to work that out for ourselves. Not brilliant in terms of its presentation, but it was good in terms of its process. And there were echoes of what both Lucy and Emma told us earlier, that that's how they analysed what was needed to be said. So in this case, somebody picked the first two bullet points and then wrote a paragraph about that. They picked the third one and said, right, I, I think I can address that one on its own. My one suggestion would be to the person who wrote this, just take the red text out because we should be able to link that back to the bullet points ourselves when we're doing the assessment. And perhaps that brings me on to the second example where I, I realised why this, well, this was a very good one, and we were able to uh, find the information so easily. Now, the highlighting of the colours is mine. I did that afterwards because I wanted to demonstrate how well this one had been done. But you could do this uh, in the approach, and I think both Emma and uh, Lucy have illustrated something similar. On the right, there was a submission, and you could see the key phrases that this applicant had picked up and had put in their narrative, which made it very easy for us to assess as, as to say, look, I can see where they uh, saw the monitoring and the review of the performance. That was the green text. The green text appears, same words on the right. I acquired knowledge of methods for monitoring and performance review. There it is. So we know immediately this paragraph is addressing that bullet point, which was made it so much easier for us to read through and say, yeah, they've clearly done that. They've got knowledge of that. And obviously they expand on it and show the level of learning. And if we went on to the next unit, followed a similar pattern. As I say, the highlighting and the colours mine, um, this, the applicant had just done this uh, in order to, to show it. Um, and again, you can see keywords picked out by me uh, in the colours and they reappeared in the text. So probably gone through a very similar process to the first example I showed you and had then just taken out the bullet points in order to make sure they'd all been addressed. So a few last points on presentation. Try to vary your narrative style. Don't begin every sentence with I know or I learned or whatever else. Try and make it varied. Uh, you could say while I was doing this project, I, I learned about or, or in some other way, just vary it a bit. It makes a, a better read for us. Try to avoid long lists. Um, basically, you will have had an interesting career in um, in transport planning so far. Very, very few people get into transport planners and don't have a varied career. So what we want to do is get that enthusiasm out of this and realise uh, what, what's um, what you've done and you're sharing with us that experience. And remember, you learned far more from what went wrong. So don't be scared to put uh, a problem in there that you solved and how you solved it. And finally, referring out to other material. The narrative in the units should stand alone. Don't say, I learned about this in a module at university and go and read it for yourself. Um, and then we uh, I did have one um, uh, portfolio which had many of the uh, module outline forms from a university uh, and the applicant had expected us to go and read through all of those to find what they learned. That's not good. OK, but you can refer out to other material for supplementary details. So you could refer out to your CV. So if you feel you haven't got quite enough space in the 500 words, you could say further details in the CV. So that's my guidance and my advice. Thank you very much for listening. And I think uh, we've got a few minutes for questions, which Greg and Kat may have been uh, pulling together. Over to you, Kat. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Lucy, Emma and Rogers. A, a fantastic session. Lots of really good advice and tips and, and things to, to think about. Um, we have just got five minutes left and I can see there's some questions that have come in in the chat. So, Greg, did you want to... Um, put the questions to the panel. Yeah, thank you, Kat. And I'll try to divide these up as evenly as possible. Um, so the first one um, would probably be best place for you, Lucy. Um, you mentioned about including projects in your CV. Um, did you only include the projects that you discussed in your evidence forms, or did you just kind of speak about projects quite generally in in your CV submission? 
I made sure that all the projects that were included in my evidence forms were also included in my CV, but there are a few more that I also added, which I thought were relevant, but I didn't include within the evidence forms because I didn't have space. Okay, perfect. Uh, and then maybe coming back to you again, Lucy, and then Emma, if you could maybe um, offer your input on this one as well. Um, how many draft versions did you kind of have to put together before you were kind of fully confident about submitting your application? That's a tough question. Um, well, I suppose to start with, I did one evidence form and sent that over to my mentor and my manager to have a look at. And that probably went through a few iterations. But then as I'd written more and more of the evidence forms, I got more confident in what was needed and there were probably less iterations on the later ones. Um, and I think also when I first started, I started when I was optimistic about how much knowledge I had. So then when I came back to it a year or two later, because I started in COVID and then got more knowledge, when I came back to it, I realised that oh, I've got loads more better knowledge now. So then I could rewrite it with, yeah, my newfound knowledge. <laughs> And yeah, uh, similar for me, I kind of uh, wrote each unit um, one by one and then sent that to my mentor and, and got their feedback directly on one unit. Um, so I probably had to do that similarly kind of two, three times per one to try and get that right. Um, and, and yeah, similar to, to Lucy as well, you know, you, you get a better understanding of the terminology, which I kind of, Roger covered quite in depth around how, it, you you know, you have to say it's knowledge based and not saying, well, this is what I did on a project. And, and, and that's how, you know, that's how my experience kind of went for it, but very much kind of putting that knowledge side into it. So the more you do it, the, the better practice you get. That's great. Thank you very much. And then, Roger, if I could come to you for a question, yeah. please. Um, is the CV and CPD record scored as part of your assessment or is it just the evidence section that's scored? Um, so maybe if you just touch upon how that can help your assessment, those different sections. Yeah, we, we do look at them because that gives us a very good idea of who you are as a person and what you've gone through. And it's often um, useful to see that, to know uh, um overall what types of things so if if there's a gap in knowledge then we might be able to look through and say well they were a project manager on this or they contributed to a study somewhere else and, and the cv will help us to understand that the cpd record again can show which courses you went on why you went on them and if if it's unclear whether you've gained a certain amount of knowledge we can pick that up from the cpd record so say it's um uh, if I were to say it's an appendix, that sounds if it's not as important as it really is. It's a very useful source of extra information. You can refer out to it, um, uh, but it takes you a few words to say, as indicated in the CV. But uh, that is a way of uh, showing further knowledge um, if, if you really are getting very short for words. But don't use it as an excuse for not writing a good narrative in the main um, section for each unit. Thank you, Roger. That's very helpful. Um, and then one final question we've received. Um, Kat, I don't know if you just want to touch upon this as part of your summary, um, but a question from an individual who said that they've just started working in the UK six months ago, um, but they do have previous experience in transport working back home um, and whether or not this non-UK experience counts for the purposes of their application or only the UK experience counts. Um, so I don't know if Kat, if you wanted to say a couple of words there. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, so the TPP units used to be quite UK focused, but they were updated in 2001 so that they have been designed to so that you can demonstrate both the knowledge units and the competence units, no matter where you've gained your transport planning experience. So you should be able to use that experience um, wherever it, it was towards both your PTK and potentially your portfolio of evidence. Um, I think that's all the questions we've got time for. We've got to, to one o'clock now. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us for this and giving up your lunchtime for this webinar. It's been sort of one of the, the best professional qualifications webinars I've, I've sat in, I think, in terms of just the um, advice that, that we've heard from, from everybody. It's sort of a lot of clear uh, steers on the sort of things to go away and think about taking time to reflect and on the units identify your gaps think about what support you need um, and sort of starting with the ones you're you're competent with I've dropped something in the chat about a link to our stakeholder engagement course that's free for CIHT members because I noted 
sort of that highlighted as a, a potential gap and there is a free course for CIHT members that's something you might want to think about um, and if we have missed your question today we'll make sure that we pick it up I can see a couple of just come in now so we'll, we'll respond to you directly but if you've got any other questions you can contact me and Greg at education at ciht.org.uk and we'll we'll help you um, with those questions and the recording will be made available on the website for anyone who who missed any of it as well so thank you very much emma lucy and roger and thank you to all of you for joining us and uh, good luck with your ptks <laughs>